Upon completing this module, you should be able to describe the principles of the DNS, describe how the DNS data is handled and organized, and last, identify the various types of DNS servers. What is the rationale of the domain name system or DNS? Hosts across local networks or the internet communicate and are reachable via an IP address. However, users make use of friendly names to connect to the host. For example, when you need to search for something on the network, you may type in www.google.com into your browser. DNS is responsible for translating that friendly name to an IP address. In this example, 173.194.34.18 is where we can reach google.com. In the past, the host files located on an operating system were used for this translation, but this is not practical today due to the number of hosts that are on the network. Therefore, DNS provides a standard naming convention for locating IP-based hosts. What is the DNS? DNS is designed to provide translations between host names and IP addresses. There are two types of translations. Type one, where it converts host names to IP addresses, or also called name resolution. In the example from the last slide, where we saw a friendly name, www.google.com, typed into a browser was translated to 173.194.34.18. The second type converts IP addresses to host names. This is called reverse lookup. In this example, 192.168.60.3 is translated into the name ftp.mycompany.com. What are some of the characteristics of the DNS? DNS stands for the Domain Name System. It is a distributed hierarchical database that uses delegation of authority, meaning that there are going to be multiple DNS servers on the network that are going to be distributed in multiple places. Each will be responsible for mapping those um, IP addresses to host names or host names to IP address. This will also include your own DNS server, which is going to be a portion of that namespace. Because of this characteristics, it overall, it makes DNS extremely scalable, where we are reducing the bottlenecks and also the single point of failure on the network. The DNS also delegates the servers, also known as the DNS servers. These servers hold the DNS information. It also delegates a protocol, also known as the DNS protocol. The DNS protocol is used by the clients to query DNS servers for resolution, and the DNS protocol is also used by DNS servers to communicate to each other via query or to transmit data. The Internet Domain Namespace is made of several levels, beginning at the top with the root level domain. Under the root level domain is the top level domains, then the second level domains, followed by the subdomains, and last, the host. Each level has a role within the namespace. The root domain is managed by the Internet Name Registration Authority. It does not have a formal name and is represented by a dot or a period. The root domain contains information of all the top-level domains. The top-level domain, or TDL, are groupings of domains at the highest level. They are either organizational, for example, .com, .edu, .gov, or they're geographical, for example, .eu, short for European Union. 
The second level domains indicate the organization that the domains belong to, such as Google or company. These are also registered with the domain name registrar. We're going to discuss this in the next slide. Subdomains are additional names that an organization can create. For example, www and eng. The host or resource names are the names that identify a particular resource. For example, FTP or more unique like Laptop 12. As we mentioned, the domain is part of the overall DNS namespace that is given to an organization, a company, or entity on the internet. The process of acquiring a domain name from a domain name registrar is called the domain registration. The domain name registrar is a company that manages the reservation of domain names. There are multiple domain registrars globally each with different pricing and registration periods. How is a host named? Every node in the DNS tree is identified by a fully qualified domain name or FQDN. In this example, let's take a look at the host. For example, Laptop 12. Hosts like domains are based on their position in the tree. Host names can be up to 63 characters in length, comprised of alphanumeric characters A through Z, either upper or lower case, numeric 0 through 9, and the special character a hyphen. Although upper and lower case letters are allowed in host names, they are not case sensitive. For example, two host names with the same spelling but different case would be treated the same. While a host name can be up to 63 characters in length, a fully qualified domain name can be up to 255 characters. There are several specific top level domains. For example, com, net, org, aero, biz, and co-op are all examples of generic top level domains. UK, FR, DE, CA, US, and AU are part of the domains that are established for countries or territories. EDU, Gov, Internet, and MIL are all sponsored or special domains. These are sponsored by private agencies or organization that have rules that are set up to restrict their eligibility into those domains. Last is the ARPA, which is the infrastructure for the top level domain or reverse domain. What is a name server? A DNS server is known as the name server. Its role is to respond to queries from the clients, also known as resolvers, and from other name servers. A name server can contact other name servers via the root domain or root servers, or they can contact other name servers via the forwarders. The name servers hold the DNS database for the portion of the namespace called the zone. For example, NS1 holds the DNS data for the zone company.com, while NS2, a subdomain of company.com, holds the data for the zone eng.company.com. What is an authoritative name server? Each domain has a name server. When a name server only contains information for its own domains, that name server is considered to be authoritative for those domains. The root servers know the name and location of each authoritative name server for all the top level domains. For example, .com, .edu. The 13 public root servers IP addresses are advertised in a HINS file. Your local DNS server will have this and maintain this file so that way it can forward the request for those domains to that server. Now that we've provided some of the background and overview of the DNS, 
Let's see how the resolution process works in this 10-step process. First, a resolver, laptop1.efficientip.com, issues a query for a fully qualified domain name on the internet using the DNS server configured in its network settings, asking, what is the IP address of www.company.com? The DNS server, ns.efficientip.com, is not authoritative DNS server for company.com domain. Therefore, the DNS server will attempt to find the answer from other DNS servers. Two, this is where the hints file is used. The DNS server, ns.efficientip.com, will use this file to obtain the IP address of the root server. The hints file shows that the root DNS server, b.rootservers.net, is located at 128.9.0.107. Okay. Three, with the IP address of the root server, the DNS server will query the root DNS server. Asking again, what is the IP address of www.company.com? Four, since the root server does not store this detail of information, it will respond back with the best answer or a list of the top level servers for that .com domain. In other words, it is executing a referral to another DNS server. Five, the DNS server, ns.efficientip.com, will again send a query, but this time it will be to the IP address of the top level domain server that was provided by the root. For example, .com domain could be found at f.gtld-servers.net. Six, that top level domain DNS server will respond back with its best answer. Because this server contains all the .com domains, it will refer to the authoritative name server for that particular domain or company.com. Seven, for the last time, the DNS server repeats the request to the company.com DNS server or ns2.company.com. Eight, the DNS server is responsible for company.com and will respond back with the authoritative answer. For example, the IP address of the web server running www.company.com or 65.76.34.102. Now that the DNS server ns.efficientip.com has the answer for the client, it will cache that response and send the response back to the originating client such as the IP address of www.company.com is 65.97.34.102. This whole process takes only milliseconds. 10. The client will now be able to connect to the web server for company.com. When processing their recursive queries, the name servers acquire information about the domain space, including the name servers which are authoritative for the zone in their IP address. This information is temporarily stored in the cache of the name server. Due to the storage of this information, when subsequent queries are made, the process time is decreased because the information is already available on that name service cache. When the data is stored in the cache, the time to live or TTL timer controls how long a cache record is valid. When the TTL expires, the cache data is deemed to be invalid and new data must be obtained from the authoritative name servers. However, this is not performed automatically. This will be updated when the next query happens. The TTL timer is critical to guarantee that the cached information is periodically refreshed. 
in the case where information that could be stored on the authoritative name servers change. The response of the query or the record that is in the cache will be stored on that local name server and it'll consist of three sections. One, it'll have the answer to the query. Second, in the authoritative section, it'll have the information of the name server and the start of authority record. And last, in the additional information, it'll have information such as the A record for the um, name server for that information. So that now we have that IP address for that name server. So how is the DNS information transmitted? The transport protocol that is used to carry the DNS protocol messages are either going to be TCP or the UDP. They are both going to use the destination port of 53. UDP is used typically for normal lookups, while TCP is also used for normal lookups um, when the response size exceeds the 512 bytes. TCP is also used for the DNSSEC um, and other operations like zone transfers, where there may be a danger of dropping packets when, if you, when you're using UDP, which is considered to be an unreliable delivery protocol. There are many types of name servers on the network. Some of the possible roles are the following, caching only, authoritative or forwarder. The first type of server we're going to look at is the caching only DNS server. This server is not authoritative for any domain. It obtains all of its DNS information from other DNS servers which are authoritative for that domain that have been queried by the client. The answers to the queries are going to be stored in the cache of this server so they can be used later. So just to review the query process, you can see that the client here makes that query. That query goes to the local DNS server. In this case, the DNS server doesn't have the answers, so it queries other name servers. Going through that referral process that we reviewed earlier. The answer then is found, and that answer is then stored in the cache based on those three sections that we just discussed previously, the answer, the authoritative, and the additional information. The second type of server is an authoritative DNS server. The authoritative DNS server stores the local information about a domain in a zone file. It provides answers in response to queries about names in the zone file by resolvers or clients or from other name servers. The data in a zone file are in the form of resource records or RR. Below is the standard resource record syntax. First is the owner or the domain name of where the resource record is found. Next is the time to live, and we talked about time to live earlier, followed by the class or the protocol family. Typically, you're going to see IN, which is short for Internet, followed by the type. This is the type of resource record that you're adding to your zone file. It could be A, C name, MX, and there's a few other ones. Last is the resource record data or our data. Here is where the data will be entered depending on the type of resource record that is being created. The table below illustrates the most common resource record types. The A is the address record. For example, the IP address of the host. The quad A is the same as the A record, but this is going to be used for your IPv6 address. The C name is the canatonic name or alias name for a host. Then you have your PTR record. This is a pointer record. Typically, this will be found in the reverse um, zone. 
And so this is your reverse lookup address. The NS record or the name server record is going to have the name of the authoritative name server. The MX record, the mail exchanger, this is where we specify information about your SNMP mail servers. And then the last one, the SOA record. This is your start of authority record. The third type is called a forwarder name server. A forwarder is a designated server in which a particular subnet or all external queries are sent to by another DNS server within the network. The other DNS servers forward the queries that they cannot resolve themselves locally. For example, to a domain that is external, which would have result in a recursive query. A forwarder builds up a large cache of external DNS information because the external DNS queries in the network are all resolved through that server. Using a forwarder to handle external DNS queries limits the exposure of your other DNS servers to the internet. How does a forward name server work? If an employee queries the internal name server and if the record is not found in the database, the internal name server sends a recursive query to the forwarder, expecting it to find the answer. If the forwarder does not have the answer locally, then it will query the other name servers in order to provide the answer back to the internal name server and the client. Below is a summary of some of the best practices to use when securing the DNS server of a company. First, split the public DNS from the private DNS. Separate the authoritative from the recursive cache. Set up high availability, for example, a master and slave. Use hidden servers. Ensure data integrity, such as DNSSEC. Also, restrict access to the internal server to employees only. Let's take a look at the best practices of splitting the private DNS servers from the public DNS servers. Here we have a typical enterprise topology of a company network for eCorp.com. In this example, the public DNS servers are accessible via the internet. These are available to the public users. These DNS servers allow users to resolve IP addresses for services that are reachable on the internet, such as a company website. Internal confidential data is reachable typically on your private network. Therefore, instead of using the public DNS, they have deployed an internal DNS. They have also coupled this with a separate DNS resolver. So queries to the internal network and through the external network results in a stored um, cache on a separate server. Going a little bit deeper, the external and internal DNS domains of eCorp.com are administered in authoritative only servers. These authoritative servers can be implemented using BIND or NSD. Now adding an internal DNS resolver will split the authoritative DNS from the recursive DNS, increasing the response time of your authoritative DNS servers. The DNS resolver, since it's a caching only server, can be implemented in bind or unbound. Another method to protect your public DNS is by using the stealth architecture, where the primary master server is hidden or not advertised onto the network. And one of the secondary slave servers is configured as a pseudo master and the other one is configured as a slave. Both of these servers would be updated with the reliable information from the primary master via zone transfer. And both of these servers will also be advertised to the network as the authoritative servers for the company. For example, www.ecorp.com. Now that you've learned more about the DNS standard, we are looking forward to seeing you in one of our instructor-led classes.